And at the bottom, the, the, it's so deep, you could fit Everest in it. So if you put Mount Everest in there, the summit of Everest wouldn't reach the rim of the crater. It's kind of obvious to say it's possible into the future, because of course that's what we're doing, we're moving into the future. It then gets interesting because you say, well, why do we have to go into the future? Why can't I stop going into the future? Well, you can vary the rate at which you go into the future relative to someone else. For example, if I was to get in a rocket now and accelerate off, even at 1G, right, just a sort of acceleration I could take, and, and head off and end up traveling relatively close to the speed of light, and let's say go to the Andromeda galaxy, and then, which is two million light years away from, from the perspective of the Earth, and then turn around and come back again. If I go close enough to the speed of light, I could arrange it so I would age, let's say, a year on the outward journey and a year on the inward journey. And you could do that calculation. But four million years would have passed on Earth. So I would come back on that journey two years older, but I'd arrive at the Earth four million years in the future. So that's just, that's special relativity. That's Einstein's theory published in 1905. It's not even the theory of gravity. It's, it's the most beautiful, ridiculous story. The, the prediction, which dates back to the 1960s, is that sometime after the universe got to the size of a melon, and remember, the universe today has got 350 billion galaxies in it, each with 100 billion stars. Yes. Once upon a time, it was the size of a melon. Some point after that, it was expanding and cooling, and something crystallized or condensed out into empty space, like almost like maple syrup or something. The universe gets filled with this stuff as it cools. And today, now, we are massive, we are solid, because our particles are interacting with that cosmic treacle or whatever you want to call it. You get mass, so you're, th these particles are solid because they're interacting with this stuff, except for light, which isn't, which travels at the speed of light because it doesn't interact with it. It's a prediction from the 1960s, a mathematical prediction. Then, about 10 years ago, we decided to build the biggest scientific experiment ever built, 16 miles in circumference underneath Geneva. We accelerate protons, which are these simple particles, to 99.999999% the speed of light, at which the speed they circumnavigate this ring 11,000 times You get second. them spinning around this and ring one, really one fast. Way, one the other way. We collide together 600 million of these every second. In every collision, we create the conditions that were present less than a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. We take photographs of those 600 million collisions per second, and we find out this guy from 1965 was right which is, I think, one of the most remarkable <laughs> achievements. In science, uh, at the moment, space science, we have this debate a lot, actually, because, of course, um, space probes like Curiosity that's on Mars at the moment, that's really cheap uh, compared to sending people to Mars. And so quite often the scientists who want to find out about the world will say, well, we should spend it on robots. We shouldn't spend it on people. I think crude space exploration is... In in some ways, I mean, it's clearly true at the moment that humans can do more than robots, so we can explore the place better. For now. Um, yeah, but, but I think it has to be, it's about something else. I mean, it's about, it, and it's not only, it, it's about living and working off the planet, which I think is quite a persuasive argument, actually. We've, we've already industrialized near-Earth orbit. So it's already a multi-billion dollar mm. industry, you know, communication satellites and weather satellites, GPS, whatever. You know, we're already up there. And so learning to live and work in space is, I think, a natural extension of our, of our civilization. It's very real as a possibility. For example, there's something called the inflationary multiverse. So one of our best theories of how our universe got to be the way that it is, is that before the Big Bang, then space and time still existed, and space was stretching very fast. It's a theory called inflation. And then that period of time draws to a close, so that the, the expansion rate, this incredibly fast expansion rate, slows down, and kind of the energy driving it collapses, changes form or state, and that's what we call the Big Bang. So the Big Bang is the end of inflation. Quantum mechanics does appear to suggest that, that really there are an infinite number of universes um, so every possibility for every interaction that happens has a probability of it. It's like rolling a dice and you could say, well, I roll a dice and it comes up a three, but you, it could also be a two or a four. 
And uh, basically, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics is that there's a universe in which every dice roll happens. So, so you get an, an infinite number of copies of you, for example, in this inflationary multiverse, uh, not the inflation, but the, the, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And we, we discovered a thing called a double pulsar, which is two stars, the mass of the sun, compressed into something about the size of LA. So imagine the mass of the sun into something the size of LA. They're rotating around each other about once every two days. One of them's spinning 40 times a second. The other one's going around once every two seconds. And Einstein predicts that they fall into each other at a rate of seven millimeters a day in 1916. A few years ago, we, we find this thing, we do the measurement and we find out it's true. These things, these two stars, drifting in at seven millimetres a day. It's interesting, actually, because we know something about the history of Mars now, quite a lot about the history of Mars. And it's certainly clear that there was water, almost certainly oceans, rivers. So, and that water is almost certainly still there. So, I would say certainly still there. Well, they have found large quantities of ice now. Right. Yeah, so there's certainly ice. There may even be pockets of liquid water below the surface somewhere. So uh, um, couple that with all the, the minerals and the resources that we know are there, and you have everything you need. So that's the thing about Mars. It's, it's quite nice relative to everywhere else other than the Earth. You, you can't go to Venus. Right? Right. You, you just melt. It's, what is it, 400 and something degrees and uh, 90 atmospheric pressure. Yeah. So, so, so Mars is quite nice. For impacts from space, asteroids or comets, they're, they're pretty much as destructive as, as each other. And uh, the dinosaurs, but the big dinosaurs were wiped out by such an impact. There's an estimate actually that that kind of scale of impact that civilization destroying or really affects uh, life on Earth, that, that uh, well, some of the estimates are one, one in a hundred million years or so. Um, just as, as, a, as a broad estimate, knowing what we know. And it's worth noting that the asteroid that took the dinosaurs out was about, what, 60 odd million years ago. So, you, you know, if you didn't understand statistics, you'd say it's time for another one. We have mapping projects. So we, we map, we think we've mapped all or nearly all of the big asteroids that cross the Earth's orbit. Um, so, and we monitor them and we have what's called a keyhole system, which means that if, because their orbits can change through gravitational interactions with each other or with nudges from Jupiter's uh, gravitational field and things like that, so they can change orbits, these things. And so we have a thing called a keyhole system, which if they go through this point in space, then we get more worried about it when it comes around again, and then we start tracking them more accurately. And we have had a couple of missions now to go land on asteroids, take samples from asteroids. We had an impact mission, which impacted an asteroid. So, so we, we, we are trying or, or beginning to develop the capability to move one if we need to move it. The problem is comets. Comets are nasty because they're big and they, they often come in. Uh, we, we don't know they're there, basically. We only see them when they're on the way in. And so if, if a comet came, um, and, for example, there was a, a comet called Schumacher-Levy 9, which hit Jupiter um, a few decades ago. I can't remember the exact date. But that thing hit Jupiter, and the, the, the marks it left in the clouds of Jupiter were larger than the Earth. So you, you get a sense that these things are nasty things. So we don't want one of those coming, because there's nothing we could do. Hey. There are places on Mars that there's a very deep crater called Hellas, which is a big impact basin. And at the bottom, the, the, it's so deep, you could fit Everest in it. So you put Mount Everest in there, the summit wow. of Everest wouldn't reach the rim of the crater. So it's, it's something like, I don't know what it is, seven miles deep or something, wow. six miles deep. So you could go there, and at the bottom, the, the atmospheric pressure is so high that you could just about have liquid water uh, on, occasionally on the floor of that crater. And so it's quite warm go. sometimes. It can be 20 degrees. Really? Yeah, there, <laughs> Celsius. Um, wow, so, so better than occasion. Minnesota right now. Exactly. Minnesota's so, experiencing a serious cold front. <laughs> that's right, yeah. So it can be warmer than Minnesota. And uh, so, so there are places where, where it's not horrendous on Mars. Uh, you know, so the Martian is, is kind of realistic in that sense. So time travel is possible into the future and 
it's inevitable <laughs> that you travel into the future and you can vary the rate you go into the future relative to someone else by the way that you travel around. In the past, Einstein's special theory of relativity from e equals mc squared, that thing in 1905 says no, you can't because of the really the geometry of space and time themselves. Uh, his general theory of relativity where space and time can be curved, that's his theory of gravity, the correct thing to say is that we can imagine uh, distortion, geometries is the best way to say it. We can imagine geometries of, of space and time. Uh, wormholes would be an example where if you could go through them, you could travel into the past. However, we don't understand enough. So you can calculate these things. Um, but whether or not they're possible to make is, a, is an open question. Most people think not. And the last thing I'll say, Stephen Hawking wrote a very famous paper called The Chronology Protection Conjecture. And conjecture is important. So it, he conjectured that whatever the ultimate laws of quantum gravity are, they will be such that you can't build time machines that you can use to travel into the past.